Hi there and welcome to Walkie Soccer. I'm your host, Caitlin Herzog. Tonight we revisit history and talk American soccer with former U.S. men's coach Bob Gansler and special guest Alexander Nikolic. We look back at this week's action in the Premier League and get behind the scenes of Milwaukee's top professional soccer club. All that after the whistle here on Walkie Soccer. Welcome to the inaugural episode of Walkie Soccer. I'm your host, Caitlin Herzog. On tonight's show, we'll introduce you to many of the faces and members of your local soccer community. If nothing else, that's the purpose of Walkie Soccer, to provide a spotlight for one of the most vibrant but underrepresented bastions of the world's game. With that in mind, we'd like to introduce you to Milwaukee's premier professional soccer team. The Milwaukee Wave has opened their doors for us to take a little peek behind the scenes. Let's take a look. Lashing lights. Pulse pounding action. Passionate players. And a rewarding fan experience. This is what's in store for you when you catch a Milwaukee Wave game. The rapid intensity of this competition pushes players to the brink of their physical limits and provides unmatched entertainment for the adoring fans. But. To score goals on game day, you have to begin on the training pitch. Here at Milwaukee's U-Line Soccer Park, the Wave players condition their minds, bodies, and technical skills. But it's more than just competitive desire that fuels these players. Playing for the Wave is something more to them. Uh, it's, it's a privilege to play for this club um, and be in this organization. There's a lot of kids that come to the games and camps, um, so... You know, I like the I like the weight on my shoulder. I like kids looking up to me. It's the fans, you know, uh, they're always here for us, supporting us. I think uh, the minimum we can do is give everything in there and then just, you know, have them cheering for us. And as long as they are happy and we're doing our thing, uh, I'm happy too. And we have an opportunity as players to show the kids in our community to become one of us later on in life. The youth is a specific focus for the club which provides countless camps, charitable events, and competitions for soccer, dance, and so much more. These are just a few of the ways the Wave gives back to the city they call home. This level of dedication to the community even extends to game day, when the club hosts theme nights, special promotions, and even honors hometown heroes. So, to the players, the fans, and the community. The Milwaukee Wave isn't just a soccer club. It's a resource, a social gathering, and most of all, a passion. Ah, so it's not just Chicago that has a professional team right in their own backyard. Visit MilwaukeeWave.com for tickets and more information. Well, indoor isn't all we have on the pitch for you today. Our next guest is the architect of much of Wisconsin's youth soccer structure and is the former director of Milwaukee Kickers Soccer Club, Alexander Nikolic. Alex, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Glad <laughs> to be here. Great. So I'd like to uh, begin with a deep dive a little bit into the uh, organization of soccer in the Milwaukee area. Well, when I came here in 1954, I came from Serbia, and there was only uh, immigrant clubs. There was no youth, and uh, so we played with the older guys that were playing the game and Sundays was to dedicate to the to the game. The youth started in 1960 when Wisconsin Soccer Association uh, declared that every club must have a youth team. So I started coaching in 1960. By 1965 I was the head of the program for the Milwaukee Serbians and uh, we had a bunch of teams uh, primarily uh, immigrant kids and uh, or the uh, they were born here but parents were immigrant and they start bringing their friends the school friends neighbors start bringing them to to the game uh, and start playing with them and uh, we were getting a flood of kids who wanted to play and the club was resisting the idea of hmm. bringing in 
other kids. So I offered them a suggestion, and uh, the suggestion was, let us start up the American uh, Club for the American Kids with a motto, American Soccer is Our Goal. And that's <laughs> how Milwaukee Kicker started on uh, November 1st, 1968. Um, and uh, there was uh, 12 founders, six, six couples, uh, four couples were with the uh, Milwaukee Serbians. That was myself, my wife Helga, my brother Milan and his wife, um, and uh, Cyrus and Elfrida Sammy, uh, and, uh, Lou and, Lou, uh, Lou and Lou and Louise Dre. So those were the, then joined later on by um, Lorenzo and um, Carol Dragicchio and Frank uh, and Dorothy Crawl. So that's what the 12 founders who started the club. And it evolved from there to the point where we were getting the kids to bring their, uh, their sisters to start <laughs> to play. And that's how the girls program started and then the gates opened up. Right. And it was just a flood of kids coming in from all over. We, in the early 90s, we got to be as close to uh, 11,000 players wow. all over Wisconsin, some in Illinois. And then as that grew, they became, the, the, they didn't have to go and play with the kickers. Right. They could form their own groups. And so we're still there. Nice. You know, so we're playing with about 6,000 kids now. So uh, we were talking, uh, your wife actually had a, a hand in getting public school soccer clubs started. Explain oh, that a little bit. Okay, what happened, I got a phone call in 1969 from Gene Edwards, then the president of the Wisconsin Soccer Association and United States Soccer Association. And he said to me, Alex, there's a kid from Marshall High School, his name is Rob Thomas. Uh, he wants to start a, uh, a soccer team at Marshall. Please help him. <laughs> so I got in touch with him, and I became the first coach there at Marshall High School to coach the team. At first, they were uh, in, in the kickers leagues. But then we said, let's start up the uh, other schools. And I was coaching the uh, Wisconsin soccer youth all-star team, played colleges, coming back from Green Bay in 1969. Uh, we, we asked the other kids to go to their schools. And in 1970, we, were, we had eight schools. We had the first tournament. Hmm. And now oh, this was club teams, so we said, okay, we got to make it varsity. I mean, it makes sense. Right. We even started a girls' school, uh, club teams, and they didn't get anywhere. We tried calling, kept on calling. The uh, athletic director wouldn't answer my phone calls. And I, one evening, I was kind of mumbling around the house. My wife said, what's, what's wrong? What? I said, well, I'm, we're trying we, for months. We've been calling this Jack to carry him. <laughs> And he would not answer our calls. She said, well, Jack DeCarian, he was my grade school teacher, seventh <laughs> grade, and he, I'll call. So she calls him, and she meets him a couple of weeks later, and that fall, that was... The women's the, the, touch the, the, that we were the, talking the, about the, before. Yeah, yeah <laughs> it's, 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 the varsity was recognized by Milwaukee Public Schools. That's great. And uh, quickly, um, what do you think you could do to improve the Milwaukee youth soccer um, system today? What I would like to suggest to all the coaches to focus on developing technique, touch, the skills, forget the record, work on the skills with the kids. That's important. That takes you further anyway, right? That's right. All right. So. Alexander Nikolic, thanks again for Welcome. sitting down with us today. We'll see you in again, again in a second with the okay. panel. But first, our director, Ryan Enbaum, reviews this past week's action around the globe. Hi there, folks. I'm student director Ryan Enbaum, and I'm here with your Premier League review for the week of January 28th. Winter is still blue for Chelsea fans as the once title favorites continue to slide down the table. After Bournemouth handed them a 3-0 bruising this past week, manager Maurizio Sarri once again used his post-match press conference to lambast his players for a lack of motivation and execution. Considering owner Roman Abramovich's track record of firing high-profile managers mid-season, Sarri's seat is surprisingly sultry in his first go-around at Stamford Bridge. Meanwhile, first place Liverpool appears to be sputtering as of late. 
While prolific strikers Mohamed Salah and Sadio Mane are both top five scorers for the season, misfortune has led to defensive woes and two points dropped against Leicester this week. To add insult to injury, Leicester center back Harry Maguire scored the equalizer against the league leaders following an obvious denial of a goal scoring opportunity that was met by the referee with an unusually lenient yellow card. Troubles continue on the north side of London, with Maurizio Pochettino's Tottenham team losing two key players in Harry Kane and Deli Ali to injury until March. With no transfers to speak of at this time and very little time left in the window, it appears the club's decision to forego summer transfers may have spelled disaster for a once promising campaign. Since the unceremonious sacking of Jose Mourinho, Manchester United have looked like the man you old. Interim manager Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has reinvigorated a once apathetic locker room to the tune of eight wins and one draw as of time of recording. With Chelsea and Tottenham struggling, Man U are in a good position to reclaim a Champions League spot by the end of the year. Over on the blue side of Manchester, City chugs along, five points behind first place Liverpool, with Klopp's heavy metal heads now in sight thanks to their recent struggles and City's prolific scoring form. City have scored 31 goals in eight matches in all competitions since the new year. However, that does include a surprising defeat to bottom dwellers Newcastle this past Tuesday in the league. Only four points separate Wolverhampton in 7th from West Ham in 12th as the mid-table shapes up for another typical season. With the exception of some stunning goals from players like Raul Jimenez and Callum Wilson, these middle-of-the-road clubs find themselves in safe, but unexciting territory. Finally, with seemingly eight teams in the relegation fight, the bottom of the table is inserting some much-needed drama outside of the top four. Huddersfield Town is as good as gone, but there is still a fight between Cardiff, Fulham, Burnley, and Southampton. Southampton, however, appear to be recovering well under new coach Ralph Hassenhutl and have clawed out of the relegation zone toward a position more fitting of a club of their stature. Well, this has been your Premier League update. I'm Ryan Enbaum. Back to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Ryan. You totally know your stuff. Now, our final guest is a very special member of the Milwaukee soccer community. After captaining the U.S. Olympic team in 1964 and 1968, Bob Gansler went on to carve out an influential coaching career with MLS club Kansas City Wizards, the U.S. national team, and even our local Milwaukee Rampage. Bob, it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here. <laughs> so, uh, I understand you were born in Hungary, um, but you forged a legacy in American soccer here. How did that get started? Well, uh, it's, it's a story that's often told about immigrants. Uh, we, we floated around uh, Europe for a while, born in Hungary, but really in a German village, uh, uh, forced to go to Germany after World War II, uh, really not considered German, but considered Hungarian by, by the locals. So my dad uh, decided uh, t on the American av adventure uh, for, for, a, for a better uh, life for my mom and my dad and I. He had an uncle here in Milwaukee, and that's how we, we got here. So early 50s. But uh, the, the, there was no so soccer for, right. for youngsters at that time. Uh, I played baseball. I played basketball. Uh, uh, and I enjoyed that. But uh, soccer was always in the back of my mind. And when I was 15, finally got a chance to play on a men's team because, as I said before, there was no youth. And when, when you got to be good enough, you were old enough. And they needed some warm bodies. And uh, that's when Alex and I played against each other, he on the Serbians. Mm -hmm. Eye on the Bavarians, and uh, uh, it wasn't until quite a bit later that the uh, the, the youth development came about. So uh, that's how we got here. That's great. So considering the two recent victories for the U.S. team against Costa Rica and Panama, um, how do you feel about the future of the U.S. national team? I, I think uh, the future will be will be bright. I think uh, the younger generation, and I include you among that, <laughs> them. Probably a little dissatisfied with the hiccup of not qualifying for the last last World Cup, and that's understandable. By the way, Italy, who has won this World Cup about four times, uh, they weren't there either, and neither was Holland, right? And and so it happens. It was a hiccup. But but uh, uh, soccer continues to grow, and and we said in the 90s we we talked about it wasn't a matter of getting more youth players to play because the the bottom of the pyramid was fine in terms terms of numbers is about the the quality on top in order to get the quality on top of the pyramid you need you need a professional league so the challenge in the 90s and that continues uh, is to make soccer a spectator sport right. so MLS uh, has continued to grow when I was in Kansas City I think we had 12 teams uh, you're in the low 20s now 
the 27th franchise has just been gra granted to Austin. Uh, word is they're not going to stop because they have more people wanting to come into the league uh, than they, they, they presently have. So uh, it'll be just like the NHL and the NBA, and it'll mm -hmm. be low 30s, and uh, folks will uh, uh, continue to come because that's the key, spectator sport. Right. And uh, as we talked uh, uh, before this broadcast started, uh, the last MLS uh, Cup was in, held in the same stadium that uh, the, uh, and I forget what happened yesterday. Oh, Can you help Super me? Bowl. Oh, yeah, Super Bowl. Right. Oh, <laughs> there you go. And there were just as many people in to watch the, uh, the MLS Cup as they were to watch the Super Bowl. Yeah. Uh, U.S. right now, the U.S. League is fourth in the world in terms of attendance. Oh. So the premiership, right? And you talked about this here, and the Bundesliga in Germany, and the uh, the La Liga in, in Spain have higher average attendance for their for their uh, weekend uh, encounters mm -hmm. than the U.S. But the U.S. is uh, has more than Italy and more than France. Wow. And you want me to name all the other countries <laughs> in Europe and all of this? So it, yeah. the future augurs well, That's and right. and and not only that part of it, but the fact that all. MLS teams now have their own academy, which means right. they, they have their own farm team in-house, U18s, 16s, 14s, 12s, and all of that. And uh, uh, that means that, and, and half of them are, are dorm situations. Hmm. So the kids live there. Really? Right? And they, they, they're being educated academically and soccer-wise. And uh, the future looks the f future looks bright. Great. So you you worked for uh, in Kansas City for a couple of years. And how was uh, um, Alex has spoken on the Milwaukee youth um, soccer situation? What was the soccer system like in Kansas City for youth? It, it was similar to here, right? Uh, you had uh, uh, finally you had interscholastic leagues and you had uh, intercollegiate leagues and all of that, and you had youth and all of that. But I, you know, I worked for the Kansas City Wizards. The owner was Lamar Hunt. Okay. At that point, uh, the discussion quite often was, uh, what do we do in order to, and I, I would mention things like a reserve team. Mm -hmm. I would re, uh, say a, a youth program and all of that. And Lamar Hunt, who without him, there would be no MLS. Really? But his opinion at that time was, well, the high schools and the colleges are my, uh, farm system for the Chiefs. We played in, 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 in Arrowhead Park, and uh, you also owned the Chiefs. And, and uh, we said, yes, but soccer is a little bit of a different animal. So a lot of things have evolved. It continues to evolve. And soccer is part of the, the fabric of society in, in, uh, in America now, and it's, it's just going to grow. Um, so to elaborate more on working for the Kansas City Wizards and in the MLS, um, what does that, uh, what are, what is that opportunity like for coaches uh, in the MLS? Do they, do they move forward? Do they stay in MLS, or do they um, go up to maybe the national team? Well, uh, uh, the answer is yes to uh, to all of that. Uh, some some have already uh, also gone to, to to coach in Europe. Bob mm -hmm. Bradley, for example, he he coached not only in Denmark and I think it was Sweden, but as in England for a while as well. He's back in in in, in L.A. right now. Uh, so uh, there are a lot of European coaches who are coaching in the Premiership in the Bundesliga that have an eye on MLS. Right, uh, the the winner of uh, the MLS Cup was uh, was a, a coach who was the his last gig before that uh, was the Argentinian national team. So it, uh, I think the word the word is out. The acceptance is there, mm -hmm. right? Uh, nothing to be smug about because there are certainly improvements that still need to be made. But but nevertheless, I think. Uh, the U.S. is on the soccer landscape the worldwide. Radar. That's great. And then real quickly, where do you see professional soccer going in the U.S.? Uh, it'll continue to grow, right? Okay. And, and uh, when, when I was coaching in the league, we would have to pay the local stations to televise our games, hmm. right? Well, uh, that thing has turned around it's now changed. with uh, it's, it's, 
it's the Foxes and, and the yeah. ABCs and the CBSs and, and the, they are paying the league in order to televise games. So it, it shows the progress that has made the audiences out there. And, uh, you know, uh, soccer moms are a political force and a, and a shopping <laughs> entity. So uh, here to stay. That's great. Thanks, Bob. Yep. All right. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining us, Bob. I appreciate it. Um, now we'd like to welcome back Alex, Alex Niglich to join Bob and me to answer some questions from the fans of the community. Uh, we kind of put out some feelers on social media to see if they'd have any questions for you. Um, so this one actually is for Bob. Um, you're an M MLS original coach. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on the Columbus Crew situation and also uh, on the former owner, Anthony Pricor? Well, Pricor bought the, uh, the team from Lamar Hunt, who had, at, at uh, that time, like I say, he was an absolute necess uh, necessary for, for MLS and their business plan and all of that. He owned uh, and he, he sold Columbus uh, to to that gentleman, uh, I think uh, he wasn't quite realizing the revenue that he thought he would, mm -hmm. and consequently he wanted to move the team. But it was a very positive local reaction that they said we want to keep this team. I mentioned Austin getting the 27th franchise. Mm -hmm. Well, it's this gentleman getting that end of deep in 2020 or 2021 and all of that. So uh, Columbus has been, uh, has been there from the outset. Uh, it's con it will continue to grow. Uh, they have played well over the last couple of years. Actually, the present uh, national coach of, uh, of the U.S., Greg Berhalter, mm -hmm. coached and did very good, very good work in, in Columbus. So uh, I, right now, perhaps their stadium is one of the lesser ones, right? It doesn't compare to uh, that 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 building in in, in Atlanta, Atlanta. <laughs> and, and a few others, right? Uh, so I, I am sure the new owners will augment things a little bit, uh, but uh, I think uh, it was it was a good move, I, I think for for the league to uh, to find that solution to keep the the the, the Columbus uh, situation intact with new ownership. Great and. Alex, this one is for you. How did the earlier immigrant teams uh, shape the landscape? I know we talked about it a little bit, you playing for the Serbian team and Bob playing for the Bavarian team. Explain a little bit more what those uh, Sundays were like. Well, <clears throat> Bob and I, as I said, we played against each other. I can't even show you the scars <laughs> that um, he inflicted on me. Uh, so, but it was, it was kind of a day on, on Sundays, that's what we did. Yeah. That's the whole thing. Uh, and I, I think that was a start, as I mentioned before, of bringing in the neighbors, bringing in uh, other people, and that's the influence. That it's the kids of the immigrants mm -hmm. that really, I think, pushed the pushed the game to the American kids. That's great. Um, and Bob, we were talking about uh, Ziggy Schmid earlier, and. Uh, his legacy he had on U.S. soccer. Can you elab elaborate on that? He recently passed away, so kind of yeah. want to remember him. Ziggy obviously is known for his work at UCLA initially and then uh, with three different teams within MLS. I first met Ziggy uh, in, in what was started here and was absolutely was, was necessary in the early 70s was uh, education for soccer coaches because there were a lot of moms and dads, mm -hmm. right, bless their hearts, who were coaching the youth teams that uh, Alex and, and, and others uh, really uh, brought about and, 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 and saw flourish. Uh, so there was coaching education. I met Ziggy uh, doing, doing that. Uh, he was an instructor. I was an instructor. And this is while he was working at UCLA. And then when I became national coach of, of, of the U.S., actually Ziggy uh, had, had the B national team. He would, he would have the younger ones mm -hmm. and, and looking at them and, and then to move them on. So the fact that his native tongue, just like mine, is German and, and, and we could talk about people without them knowing <laughs> what we were saying. Uh, we, we've been friends. We were friends. Yeah. And, and I attended his funeral out there. Uh, he... Uh, 
he, he was a man who, who, who absolutely did yeoman's work for, for the development of the game, both as a coacher, as a co uh, coach, a coach educator. Uh, and also, he was, he was a college player, yeah. uh, a, a good player at UCLA before, be, before he became a coach there. That's great. And real quickly, Alex, off the top yes. of your head, what was the, your best goalkeeper you ever played with? Best goalkeeper was um, Milan Rankovic. That's great. Thank you so much. You're I really welcome. appreciate you both yeah. being here. Um, thanks again for uh, Alex and Bob for stopping by. This has been a Milwaukee PBS and MATC student production. Make sure to stay tuned next for Abraham Deliria's Dramatic Gasp and catch more MATC student workshops shows Sundays at midnight here on Channel 36. Good night, Milwaukee.